Where are you at the moment? In Bologna? Yes, yes, I'm in Bologna. I'm right next to Piazza Santo Stefano. Ah. Um, I'm, have you been to Bologna? Yes, I've lived in Florence for one year. Oh, wow, wow. I'm actually going to turn off my WhatsApp. All right, there we go. I think we're almost live. I just need to press a button. Okay, there we go. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I, I'm sure all of you already read um, Professor Schott's Wikipedia page. So I'm just going to say two or three things. Um, he, he's published about more than 20 books, I believe. Um, maybe something like 15 to 30, I'm not sure, but I saw a few of them. <laughs> uh, um, countless articles. And um, today we're here to talk about his book, Writing the Rules for Europe. And um, I thought I could leave um, five minutes to the professor to just tell us what he thought or what he thinks are the most important aspects of the book. And then I'll ask him some questions that we've prepared. OK. Um, well, the book tries to understand why the European integration process is so technocratic. And it uh, uncovers, reveals a root uh, coming from the 19th century uh, when uh, engineers and experts had to think about how to build knowledge infrastructures and uh, well, hardware infrastructures like railways. And uh, they designed a specific method to do international relations, which is called technocratic internationalism, with a specific role for experts. And this was experimented with uh, by the League of Nations and heavily influenced the construction of the European Union, uh, but also uh, the UN for that, for that matter, and many international organizations. Uh, so we have developed a specific way of doing international relations in the 19th and 20th century. And I also contend that this uh, approach is not sufficient for dealing, addressing the current global challenges as expressed in the SDGs and, for example, climate change. So we need to rethink how we globally or regionally, like in Europe, collaborate. Uh, that's perhaps my summary. Well, perfect. It's very difficult to find people who are able to um, concentrate their ideas in very few phases. So that was great. Thank you. Um, so maybe our first question, perhaps, would be um, on on that on hidden integration. I think is what you uh, called it in your book. Yes, so, yes. Um, oh, what do you think are the most pivotal aspects of the hidden integration that um, are not explained by the more um, state-focused or institutional? I'm not sure if I could say institutional institution, as in uh, nation states. Yeah. Um, focused approach because your approach is almost uh, I'm not sure if I could call it a procedural approach but it's uh, it's it's different in that sense and um, um, there is a second question to it but I'll ask you after your, your answer okay the hidden integration the word hidden refers to two points uh, one is the fact that these experts themselves thought that they can better better do business outside uh, the, 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 the politics of nation state. So they wanted to create spaces in which they could negotiate mundane things like how to build European railways, how to build European communication networks, energy networks, knowledge infrastructures, because they thought that uh, diplomats specifically from the foreign office and uh, politicians, but also the wider public would distort the kind of independent, neutral, science-driven process. So hidden speaks to their ideology. Uh, it also speaks to the fact that for the currently for the wider public, this process is indeed not very visible. It's invisible. Uh, so, uh, and we can question whether that is uh, desirable. Let me also say that I, I'm not thinking that 
uh, I am uh, thinking that technocracy is necessary, so we need experts. And it's not like we don't need experts, so it's not a, it's not a, a rallying cry against expertise at all. But we need to think about the boundary, how to construct the boundary between democracy and technocracy. And so the follow-up question would be, um, if you could give us some examples outside of the realm of uh, steel and railroads, um, some examples of important rules that you, you um, observed. And uh, I'm not sure if I could put it, an alternative example, I could say, perhaps. Well, the, the most recent example is the euro. You know, the euro is, is run by uh, banks. Uh, and how they do it is, is not influenced politically. So uh, the construction of the, the euro is one of the latest examples. But also in the food area, we have many uh, European food standards that nation states need to uh, apply. Uh, so in general, if you look at energy, transport, uh, water management, many of these areas, there are uh, European protocols or standards. And uh, so rules uh, refers to standards, uh, but also refers to the notion of institution, because one definition of institution is it's a, a set of rules that constructs action, that shapes action of people. So the idea is that the kind of agreements that these experts make uh, really have uh, built a European space, a European governance structure with regulatory rules, but also a European identity partly, because they allowed, for example, if you built a railway network across Europe, you allow people to travel and to explore and develop a certain type of identity, they also call Europe or European. Yeah. Um, uh, it's very interesting as well because um, wh while you're reading your book, I also thought of uh, transparency in, uh, um, I, I tried to think of the Italian uh, legislative procedure and the European legislative procedure. And uh, it's so much easier now to um, uh, see what actually happens during the European legislative procedure. And so I think things have gotten better because like, for example, in Italy to access some documents, I always, uh, we would need to send different requests and uh, pass through administrative legal procedures. So I think things have gotten better. I hope so. Um, and um, so, well, actually maybe not for the Euro group. Um, I'm thinking perhaps of our last guest, uh, Martin Heipertz, who talked about the, um, the SG, oh, the, this SGP which is the, st the Stability Pact, the Stability and Growth Pact. And it's true that a lot of uh, um, the legal procedures and a lot of the decisions are, are made behind closed doors, but um, it was very interesting to think about how things have changed or perhaps haven't changed. Um, it, it can, if I may comment, if you look at the structure of the European decision-making, at the heart of it is the European Commission. The European Commission consists of a set of experts. These are people who should give up their national uh, identity and act as an expert in the commission. And this commission is similar to what engineers were thinking about, is bringing a set of experts who bring an optimal solution. So at the heart of the European decision-making process is something which is, you may question whether it's d democratic or not. Of course. Uh, uh, and I, I I do value, let me say, because uh, often my work, to some people think I'm anti-EU, I'm not, I'm pro-EU. No, yeah, yeah, it's very clear, actually. I believe it's pretty clear in your book that you're yeah. pro-EU. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I just want to bring the dilemmas to the table. And the uh, 19th and 20th century specifically, we have seen a uh, struggle between democracy, fascism and communism. Of course. And some people think that democracy won. Uh, I'm not so sure, given the recent developments. But uh, at, at the same time, uh, we never talk about technocracy. And technocracy was the fourth important uh, stream of thinking that really has influenced 
how we have shaped societies. Uh, so my book is about making visible technocracy as a separate uh, practice and ideology. Um, I was also thinking of the trilogues, which aren't really that transparent. So there, there are actually a lot of aspects in the, in the European institutions that aren't very transparent. So without a doubt, that, that is an important point. Um, so our next question comes from a, a friend of mine, and he was wondering how, um, how could I put it? I'm just going to read what, what he says. Um, so in terms of further integration, what are the pros and cons of these, uh, these, these closed decisions or these nudges? So, because um, your book uh, explores, um, it's a, it says that it explores like a 200-year period, if I'm not mistaken, and um, um, you draw some parallelisms with uh, the the short uh, the short century, I believe. And um, so, we were wondering if you could uh, tell us what what you thought were some of the positive or perhaps negative aspects for further integration. Um, I'm not sure if my question was clear. Well, the, the, the big problem of the integration process is that it was built on this uh, technocratic idea that we do decision-making in a certain way, which meant that wider publics never could build up a relationship with the European Union because in a way they were not integrated and that was on purpose. Because, for example, agriculture policy was decided by a set of experts in Brussels without, you know, having wider publics involved. Uh, and I would say that it's still very controversial to do that. Uh, so, uh, but if we want to address climate change now, for example, uh, which is a European issue as well as a national issue and a local issue, uh, we need to think about how to do international relationships in complete new ways where people can build up loyalty and identity uh, as part of the process. And I see huge difficulties doing this through the EU uh, because the current EU is built on many treaties and many of the so you, you can't undo the treaties. Well, you need many countries to agree. Uh, so, well, one option would be, well, be a, a complete renewal. Of course, you can redesign the EU and try to do that, but that's, I, I don't see a lot of political space for that. Uh, so I think the best option is for the EU to limit its ambitions and try to connect with underlying processes of Europe, uh, Europeanization. And it partly does that. So there is, for example, there are attempts to build networks across cities. So cities collaborating across Europe and, uh, and these cities, uh, they, they involve their citizens. So the, the EU could facilitate and enable those processes instead of trying to say, I'm, the, I'm in the lead. I'm the, the main uh, uh, European actor in town. So I, I think that would uh, create a basis perhaps for future European governance structures, stronger ones. So I think just pushing them through step by step as they do now, I, I don't think there's a future for that. Um, if, I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, in a certain part of the book, you also criticize the fact that um, with a technocratical approach to making decisions, often you only, um, you only uh, let certain regions participate because certain regions have more interest, certain countries, I should say, regions in Europe as in countries, have more interest or have more interests in trying to influence those decisions, whereas others might not have influence. For example, in your book, you give the example of um, Germany and France with steel, uh, um, if I'm not mistaken, and um, how um, there are some decisions that 
exclude in a certain way some countries, which is also very interesting. And it brings us um, to our, our, our last question, actually, which is a, a sort of a brexit question. And it, it's, um, it, it asks whether, let's see if I can sum it up in a more um, condensed way, um, whether um, taking your vision of uh, a light or a hybrid version of, uh, of integration as in uh, not a heavy version with the state, states and uh, institutions, whether you think that Brexit could be explained through this lens, as in um, if, if we could have predicted in a certain way or if, if, if this could be explained through this lens. I'm not sure if it's clear. Well, Brexit is, uh, I think, a result of... Uh, neoliberal policies in the UK, which led to a lot of regional division and many people were left behind. So the cause of Brexit has nothing to do with the European Union, uh, but politicians, what they did were channeling the unrest towards the EU as if the EU was responsible for all the negative uh, consequences. Of course, in the UK, there's also the kind of idea that they can be in a, there's an alternative that they build their own empire, which they did in the past and still think they can still do. Uh, so that's another part of the explanation. But in any case, uh, I think the causes of Brexit are not directly related to the European integration, but Europe can be blamed. And of course, that blame game is going on in many countries, but the fact that this can happen is a result of the way the decision-making is structured. So, uh, and I think it will continue to happen. Uh, so, uh, it, it's difficult uh, uh, because on the one hand, we need new big ambitions to address these uh, these challenges. On the other hand, we are stuck with a decision-making structure which generates problems. And uh, one other solution could be that, uh, that we move ahead with some of the countries. Because what we have done, we have invested more in broadening than in deepening. So we have invested more in including more countries. And the e EU was even entertaining the Ukraine and other countries, which was not a very good decision, yeah. I think. But uh, so to say, okay, with, with, for certain topics, with a certain set of countries, we go further. And some countries can join, and others can decide not to join. Uh, but if I were the EU, I would also allow, as I say, other groupings to generate European spaces. And uh, without trying to control this through the EU. Um, perhaps I'm going to ask just one last question, because I thought it's very important to ask the authors of books to always give us um, three ideas from their book that they think young readers like us should, um, should remember. If there were only three things we remember, three things that we keep with us. And... Um, <laughs> following okay. a bit that's <laughs> okay well one important idea is that history matters if you want to understand the present try to look at what i call path dependencies not i call many people call it so you know we have chosen certain paths in the past and they are still with us so the history is relevant because it shapes our future so try to understand the history but the history also contains what i call alternatives that were roads not taken so you can look for the roads not taken and some of the ideas and they can inspire you now uh, so that's one point history matters uh, the other is that uh, it's important uh, well to think about uh, if you do research is to think about how to combine theory and empirical material. So in the book, we have tried to use theory, but it's not very overt. So it, it's, it's beneath 
the skin, so to say, because in overall the book is a narrative. So uh, if you want to convince people, tell stories, use narrative, but make sure that your narrative is has a kind of underlying theory or structure. Perhaps that's and uh, perhaps the last thing is that my scholarship has been uh, because I think we need to address the troubles of our time. So. Uh, it's very important, even if you do historical research or other research, that you think about how your research connects up with the current troubles uh, and how you can make a contribution. Wow, thank you so very much. I also wanted to thank um, uh, Dr. King. Your, I'm not sure if she's your, um, your student or your uh, administrative assistant. And um, Dr. Vite, I must have exchanged at least 40 emails with them, <laughs> with, at least with Dr. King. So thank you very much. And thank, thank you to them. And um, thank you so much for your time. OK. Thank um, you for uh, inviting me for the questions. So uh, and I, of course, I'm delighted to uh, hear that people are reading my uh, book. So uh, it was actually suggested to us by our, uh, let's see. I think the author from four sessions ago. Okay. I'll have to check it again. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye. Bye.